Hello, everybody. My name is Guo Xingyu. I'm with Elsa Lab, Xinzhu, Taiwan. I'll present the framework Dynamic Attention-Based Visual Dimetry to show the new concept for improving the accuracy of real works. Let's get started with previous works. We summarize the visual dimetry methods into two categories, flow-based approaches and attention-based approaches. A significant portion of research works, including LSVO, DIFVO, CLVO, have introduced optical flow as a mission into their VO models in recent years. Instead of fitting consecutive RGB frames into VO models, flow maps can be used as input for the VO models as displacement of pixels between two frames can be better employed in the process of ecomotion estimation. LSVO introduced the famous flow net in their VO module with an autoencoder in their network architecture to enhance the flow repetition. DVO and the CLVO are another flow net based framework employing recurrent memory shells to learn sequential dependency motion of an image sequence. The other researchers attempt to introduce attention techniques to enhance the accuracy of their post estimation DCNN. These techniques fall into two categories heuristic based and feature based attention methods. In the first category, attention masks to the input frames are defined based on human knowledge. In mask slam, the semantic objects such as cars and sky are manually selected to filter out feature points extract from input frames. On the other hand, in dynamic slam and movable object aware slam, predefined dynamic object regions are removed from input frames. For feature based attention methods, attention models are incorporated for addressing the relative weightings of feature representation in the post estimation DCNN. In SRNN channel, a goddess attention model is separated applied to the feature representation of the translation and the rotation estimation networks. The primary contributions of our works are first, a learning based DAVO framework that fits RGB input frames and flow maps both weighted by the generated attention maps to the post estimation DCNN. Second, a concept of using flow maps for generating dynamic attention weighted for semantic segmentation channels. Third, an approach that enables derivation of attention weighted without human supervision. Here is our proposed DAVO framework architecture. DAVO is a learning based framework based on DCNN without using depth map or recurrent memory shells. This framework includes the optimal flow estimation DCNN, which is called flow NN, and the semantic segmentation DCNN, SIG NN. In our DAVO framework, Flow NN and SIG NN are implemented based on FlowNet 2 and DeepNet 3 plus, respectively. When two RGB frames I1, I2 input to the framework, the Flow NN takes them to generate the flow map F2, which means the optimal flow from I2 to I1, and the SIG NN takes I2 to generate the semantic segmentation channels SN to be the two inputs for attention NN. There are two primary components, attention module and post NN in DAVO. Attention module includes attention NN, which takes flow maps to generate attention weighted AN. This module takes AN to multiply to the semantic segmentation SN channel wisely to generate the weighted semantic segmentation to imply which segmented segmentation category needs to be attained. There is the animation to show the process. Attention module takes the flow map and employ an attention network, attention NN, to generate attention weight for the segmentation channels. Next, attention module generates the attention map by multiplying weights with the segmentation channels and then performing channel-wise addition of them. The generated attention map is then applied to both the input RGB frames as well as flow maps. Then they are concatenated and fed into a post estimation module. The post estimation module is also called as post NN, which contains two branches a translational error estimation branch and a rotational error estimation branch. They are called 
a chance and earn and rot and earn respectively. Please note that in post and earn, we additionally use dilated convolutional layers to enlarge the receptive fields of the network. I would like to quickly show you an example of table with a video demonstration. The animation on the left hand side show the trajectories, the controls label and label. The videos on the right hand side show the video RGB frames, article flow maps, semantic annotations, and attention maps of table from the first person's perspective. Please note that for the attention map, lighter colors correspond to higher attention weights. You can see that the attention weights of table change over time and are different especially when the camera is making turns. Let's compare the effect of the attention module in our table design. The figure on the left hand side shows the result of the table variance without the attention module, while the figure on the right hand side corresponds to the result of the proposed table architecture we just discussed. This can be seen that when making a 90 degree turn, the attention module helps the table to correctly capture the turning angle. Without it, the accuracy of the estimated turning angle degrades considerably. Next, I would like to discuss three sets of ablation studies that we have performed for table. The first one is table with and without attention module. Second, a comparison of dynamic and static attention weights. And third, a comparison of table with the variance architecture that employs feature-based attention mechanism. Let's begin from our first ablation study. Here we compare table with a variance that does not use the attention module. You can see from the picture that for this baseline, the attention module has been removed. We would like to see if the attention module is really important for our table design. In our second operation study, we would like to see if our table is superior to the feature-based attention mechanism. In order to validate this, we created a variant that puts the attention modules inside the trans unknown and rod unknown branches, which are highlighted as the light green block in this figure. The attention module is implemented as an SE net, which uses a global pooling layer in dark green, followed by two convolutional layers in orange color to generate attention maps. In our third population study, we compare the difference between dynamic attention and static attention mechanism. This figure shows how we implement the static attention variance. As you can see, the dynamic attention weights have been replaced with static weights. These static weights are treated as learnable parameters and are optimized in advance for the data set. Here we compare the flow maps and feature maps of demo with the three variants we just discussed in different rules. We show a video clip of them from the KD dataset, including the original RGB frames, their flow maps, and the feature maps. In the feature maps, red regions are where the post and learn is concentrated on. For table, it is observed that the proposed attention module enables the focus regions of trans and learn to become steady and concentrated on straight roads. When the attention module of table is removed, the focus regions become unsteady and are scattered to multiple uncorrelated parts of the input frames for both trans and learn and rot and learn, leading to a degradation in post estimation accuracy. For the static attention case, the focus regions of trans and learn are widely scattered within the road areas, as well as several other regions of the input frames. Rather than concentrating on one or more specific regions or semantic categories are stable. Besides, the focus regions of what and learn consistently fall on the bottom parts of walls, no matter the camera is moving forward or making turns. For the feature-based variants, the focus regions of trans and learn are also not concentrated and scattered to multiple parts of the input frames. And the focus regions of rod and learn nearly fall on an even narrower range of the bottom parts of walls than the static attention variance. Now, let's take a look of our experimental results. We perform our experiments on the kitty dataset. We train the models on sequences 1, 2, 8, and 9, and evaluate the models on the remaining sequences. The top rows 
show the results of non-learning based monocular VO, including OPSLAN2 and VSO2. The middle rows are the baselines we considered. The results of VO and its variants are shown on the data button. In this table, we compare the translational and rotational errors and denote them as T underscore real and R underscore real, respectively. Let's first take a look of the results of Babel, which is shown on the bottom right. You can see that the translational and rotational errors of Babel are much lower than VSO2, of than 2, and most of the baselines. The average translational error of Babel is slightly higher than that of Bayesia at all, by 12 that's 70%. However, they will deliver a much lower average rotational error than it, without using any recurrent memory cell, as the main contribution of Devo is the introduction of dynamic attention. It is not surprising that the average rotational error of Devo is lower than all of the baseline methods. If you still remember, Devo uses optical slow maps as the input to its attention module. You may wonder what will happen if different input sources are used instead for generating attention maps. Here we show three separate implementations that use semantic segmentation, depth maps, and RGB frames as the inputs to the attention module. As you can see from this table, the errors of these three implementations are all higher than they were. An interesting finding from the results is that these three implementations are still better than most of the baselines, indicating that the proposed stable framework is effective even if the attention module is changed. Now let's compare table with the three variants for our ablation studies, showing on the three rows highlighted by the red rectangle. For all of these three variants, the translational and rotational errors are higher than those of table. This validates the design of table. When the static weights are used, or when the attention modules is removed, the error rate increased immediately. When the attention mechanism is changed to feature-based, the error rate also grows. Besides the error rates, we now illustrate the difference in attention weights of table and the static attention variants using histograms on the left-hand side. The top two histograms correspond to the attention weights of table for straight roads and turning things. It can be seen that attention weights of Devo are different for these two scenarios, showing that attention weights are dynamically changing for different class categories. On the other hand, the stated attention variance uses the same set of attention weights no matter the scenario is, leading to a higher error rate than Devo. Now let's use a timeline plot to illustrate the comparison from another perspective. The top figure shows the ground truth of the rotation angle, which is highlighted as the red curve. The figure in the middle shows the attention weights of table. We can see that the changes of table's weights align perfectly with the ground truth, which is highlighted as the light grid regions. Please note that the noisy regions of the table attention weights between the 650 and 730 frames is caused by the traffic flow in front of the camera when it is waiting to make a turn. Lastly, we also plot the weights of the stated attention variance here as a reference, which are maintained as constant no matter what happens. Let's also take a look of the trajectories generated by table and the stated attention variance. The ground truths are plotted as dashed lines for sequences 14, 16, and 22 in the kitty data sets that does not have ground truth labels, we use the trajectories of OPS and TRUE as references. It can be observed from the figure that the trajectories of table, which is shown in blue color, align closely with the reference dash lines. On the other hand, the static attention weight variance, which is drawn as red lines, often deviates from the dash lines. These figures therefore qualitatively validate the accuracies deliverable by Devo. In summary, Devo is a learning-based framework for estimating the info motion of the monocular camera. To validate the proposed framework, we examine Devo 
as well as its variants, and compare them with the other contemporary BO approaches on the kitty stem benchmark seeds. In our experiments, they will demonstrate its superior performance to the baseline method, both quantitatively and qualitatively. In addition, we provided a set of questions and analysis, validating each of our design choices adopted in the proposed framework. As the proposed mechanism that leverage dynamic attention weights on different semantic categories have been validated effectively and beneficial in our work, they will thus offer a promising direction for future attention-based neo researchers. And finally, thank you very much for the attention. Okay, um, we have the first paper uh, presented, which is attention-based uh, BO. Um, double check whether the author is here. So if the author is not here, we can go ahead for the second paper. And um, for the second paper, um, so right after all the four talks, all the four contributed papers, we will have a short 10 minutes, and uh, at that time, if we have the authors here, and uh, we can ask him the question. Um, if not, and uh, we can go ahead. Okay, for the second paper, that is Hunter. Is Hunter here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so you prefer to, to play the recorded video? Or you want to? I think so. playing the recording would be easier. Okay, okay. Um, but but after then we can play the video and uh, after the video we can have the Q A session. Yep. Does it sound okay? Okay. Let's play the so the second video. Hello, my name is Hunter Blanton and I will be presenting. So double check whether it works. Yeah, it's working. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So we got started from the beginning. Hello, my name is Hunter Blanton, and I will be presenting our work titled Extending Absolute Pose Regression to Multiple Scenes. This work was performed in collaboration with my colleagues at the University of Kentucky and Design Technologies. In this work, we focus on the task of single image localization. This is the process of determining the precise location and orientation of the camera with respect to a fixed global coordinate frame. Traditionally, this is performed by finding feature correspondences between the image and a known map of the scene. For example, a common approach is to determine 2D, 3D correspondences between pixels in the query image and points in the scene, and then using the perspective endpoint algorithm for final pose determination. The difficulty of this approach lies in how the correspondences are determined. A popular approach is to first find similar images through image retrieval. The known poses and 3D information of the retrieved images can be used with pixel level correspondences to find the required 2D, 3D correspondences in the query image. Another method involves directly matching pixel level features against point cloud features in the scene map using a shared feature space. More recently, direct regression approaches have become popular. In scene coordinate regression, a machine learning algorithm is used to map images from a known environment to a dense scene coordinate map. Absolute pose regression with the CNN is an alternative to these correspondence-based approaches. Instead of performing correspondence matching, absolute pose regression requires training a CNN on labeled data to directly predict the position and orientation parameters of the camera pose. Once trained, these parameters can be applied to new images to directly compute camera pose estimates. Since the introduction of CNN-based absolute pose regression with PoseNet, absolute pose regression has been an active research area. Most work focuses on modifying the network or training process in order to improve pose accuracy. For example, learning the optimal loss weighting during training has shown to improve accuracy as well as reduce the need for hyperparameter tuning. Also, there has been success in using different feature extraction architectures such as LSTM PoseNet. Additionally, using a relative pose constraint during training, like in MapNet, improves pose accuracy as well as improves the correlation between feature vectors and ground truth poses. There are several practical advantages of absolute pose regression compared to traditional methods. They typically run in only a few milliseconds on modern hardware, as opposed to the potentially hundreds of milliseconds for high quality feature matching and the use of a robust estimator such as RANSAC required for accurate final pose estimates in 3D geometric approaches. 
Also, because the CNN is a fixed computation pipeline, the complexity of the scene has no impact on inference time. Lastly, given the availability of sufficient training data, they are simple to train and easy to use. However, these benefits come at the cost of significantly worse performance in terms of pose accuracy, and unlike most correspondence-based approaches, results in scene-specific networks. That is to say, you must train a new network for each new location in order to perform accurate pose estimation inside it. While most work focuses on improving pose accuracy, we instead focus on the problem of needing scene-specific networks. Because these networks are deep CNNs, they are composed of hundreds of megabytes worth of weights, which becomes expensive to store as the number of scenes increases. We propose a method that greatly reduces the number of weights needed to be able to accurately localize within one of several scenes. A recent paper by Sadler et al. goes into detail about the intuition behind and the limitations of absolute pose regression with the CNN. They factor absolute pose regression into three stages, feature extraction, a nonlinear embedding, and finally, a linear projection onto pose space. The first stage is composed of the convolutional filters of the CNN. The second stage is composed of some number of feature transformation steps, such as a series of linear layers or LSTMs. Finally, the embedded feature vector is used to compute pose. This is computed using the final fully connected layer of the network. The weights learned during training act as a set of base poses and the projection is expressed as a linear combination of these base poses. The motivation for our work is that while the final stage requires unique base poses for the specific coordinate frames of the scene, the first two stages are not strictly dependent on the coordinate frame and can be applied in general to several scenes. Here we show an example of applying pose net for localization within n different scenes. As we just discussed, we divide PoseNet into the feature extraction, embedding, and final pose regression stages. We combine feature extraction and nonlinear embedding into a single block for simplicity. Because each scene is a unique environment with a different reference frame, a unique PoseNet is trained and used for each scene. Alternatively, we propose to share the feature extraction and nonlinear embedding stages for multiple scenes. This significantly reduces the number of parameters required as opposed to using a unique network for each scene. An overview of our approach is shown. We use a single CNN feature extractor and use a database of scene-specific weights for the final pose regression layer. Like all absolute pose regression CNNs, we first extract an f-dimensional feature vector from the query image. Given that we know the image is located in one of n scenes, we extract the f by p weight matrix, where f is the dimensionality of the CNN feature vector and p is the dimensionality of the pose parameters. For example, if we use the three xyz components for position, and the four components of a quaternion for orientation, then P would be equal to seven. This weight matrix corresponds to the trained base poses for the given scene. Once this weight matrix is extracted from the weights database, there it is used as the final layer of the network just as in PoseNet. To allow for completely automated use of our approach in the case where it is unknown in which scene the camera is located, we also use the CNN extracted feature vector for scene classification. In this case, we predict an n-dimensional probability distribution over all scenes and use the most probable scene to index into the weights database. In this way, our approach can be thought of as a course-defined localization approach where we first identify the course scene location and then perform precise camera pose localization. For this work, we make use of the common Microsoft 7 Scenes dataset. This is composed of seven indoor scenes of varying complexity. We also use the Cambridge Landmarks dataset. As opposed to seven scenes, this dataset contains six outdoor environments, each at the scale of hundreds of meters. We first evaluate our method for pose accuracy. We report median translation and orientation error in meters and degrees. We compare our multi-scene PoseNet method, denoted as MSPN, to PoseNet and MapNet, two state-of-the-art absolute pose regression methods. These methods are trained for a single scene at a time, while ours is trained on all scenes of the dataset. This means seven total for seven scenes and six total for cameras landmarks. We also compare it to a, a naive baseline approach in which we train a single pose net for all scenes simultaneously with no modification. For seven scenes, our method is competitive with and sometimes outperforms the single scene approaches. To highlight the advantage of our method, we mark in red the cases where we significantly outperform the naive multi-scene baseline. For camera landmarks, our method does not perform as well. We discuss this on the next slide. In the 
next experiment, we evaluate our method for training on different subsets of scenes. Specifically, we train on all but one scene from each data set. For example, the line labeled without fire means we trained and evaluated on all other scenes from the seven scenes data set. Because we did not train on the fire scene, we cannot evaluate and this cell is left empty. For seven scenes, we see that performance is more or less constant regardless of which subset is used for training. However, we see a significant difference in performance for camera landmarks when not using the street scene. In this case, we actually begin to see position error on par or better than the single scene methods. This is interesting because the street scene is very complex and difficult even for traditional methods. We believe the difficulty of this scene is expressed in the impact that it has during training of the other scenes. We next evaluate the impact of scene classification in our network. To test this, we perform localization in two scenarios. In the first, which we call the scene oracle approach, the scene of the query image is known, so the correct final layer weights are always extracted from the weights database. The second approach, labeled end to end, is the case where we have no prior information about the location of the query image. In this case, the network must first perform scene classification in order to determine which weights to pull from the database. For both datasets, we use all scenes for training. We report both median position and orientation error, as well as top one scene classification accuracy. Note that even in the cases where the scene accuracy is 100%, the metrics differ because each experiment was trained separately. For seven scenes, there is not a significant change in performance between the two experiments. For Cambridge landmarks, however, we observe more varied error metrics. The position error is typically better in the end-to-end -end case, but orientation error is typically worse. For all other experiments in this presentation, we report metrics computed using the scene oracle approach. Next, we investigate how well the learned features from the CNN generalize to novel scenes. In this experiment, we pre-train our network on six of the seven scenes and use the CNN as a starting point for transfer learning to the held out scene. The scene specific final layer is randomly initialized. We compare to the normal ImageNet initialization after training for only one epoch. After this short training period, the CNN pre-trained on other scenes produces much lower median error across the board. We also show the same experiment extended to 10 epochs for the fire scene. For both initialization methods, we show median position error in meters on the top figure and median orientation error in degrees on the bottom figure. The x-axis is the training epoch. Initializing from multi-scene PoseNet training on other scenes not only converges to lower error, but reaches the minimum much faster. Finally, we evaluate the impact of training not only with multiple scenes, but with multiple scenes from two separate datasets. For this experiment, we train our network for three scenarios. First, we do single scene training. Next, we train with all scenes from within the same dataset. And finally, we train with all 13 scenes from both the seven scenes and Cambridge Landmarks datasets. We plot the median position and orientation error of each training scenario for each scene. Single scene training is denoted by the blue bars, single dataset training by the red bars, and multi dataset training by the green bars. Note that even in the single scene training case, we train the networks ourselves. So this does not correspond to the reported PoseNet or MatNet metrics. Overall, we observe that performance is relatively stable in most cases, regardless of the training setup. Thank you for watching. Okay, thank you. Um, stop sharing. Um, so Hunter, are you here still? I'm still here. Okay. Um, I, got the, I got a question from the audience. Um, the audience is asking a question regarding extending the absolute pose regression to multiple scenes. And uh, here, uh, the, other, the, the audience is asking, do you decide one scene for an image where had association? And the follow-up question would be, would a probabilistic scene assignment could be better in the scene selection in your uh, pose estimation? Could you repeat the first question? Oh, so it's, it's mainly about whether when you train the multiple scenes, do you decide one scene for one image where had association? Yeah, so each image is assigned to a single scene. Okay, and, uh, and the follow-up question is, 
do you think a probabilistic scene assignment could be better in host estimation when you're training? So in this case, I think the um, non-probabilistic approach would make more sense since we're doing this fixed um, like final linear regression into the pose. Um, but there is work uh, such as ESAC from, I think it was published in ICCB last year, uh, where they do do a more probabilistic um, like scene prediction. And then they factor that into their uh, like ransack based approach for the final uh, pose determination. Okay. Um, one question for me is um, in post night, um, the post night authors claim in their paper, their size, their network size is always keep to be uh, within 50 megabytes. And uh, do you have the number for your network size? And uh, when you run this network, do you have the, the do you, do you have the number for for the speeding? For example, how long how how long it takes to localize one image? Yeah. So uh, for the networks we used, um, I I don't remember exactly, but I it was around 150 megabytes uh, per model. Okay. And the for speed, it was about um, five seconds on is a ten seventy GPU. Okay, five seconds. Or, uh, five millisecond. I'm sorry. Five oh, milliseconds. okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is that. That makes much much more yeah. sense. I'm so used to working at the scale in milliseconds. <laughs> okay. Great. Okay. So right now, you 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 the network size is becoming. Um, bigger than the post night. What do you think it mainly increases the size uh, of the from post night? I'm actually not sure. Um, I would okay. have to go back and look at it. It, it may be that the uh, the way I'm saving the weights. Okay. So, okay. so I'm just looking purely at uh, like when I train it in PyTorch, the model that gets saved is on the order of hundreds of megabytes. Um, it, it could be that the actual uh, necessary parameters in there are closer to 50 megabytes. Okay, cool. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't see any other question. And, uh, and thank you again. Yep. And there are about another 170 people and watching you, watching you, 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 you talk. So I would say they am the representative of, of the, all the audience. Okay. Um, so let's go to the next. Um, the next would be, let's stop sharing first. Okay, um, the next would be Anikit. Is Anikit here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so you will give a live presentation, right? Yes. Okay, okay. Please go ahead. Yeah, just a second. Sure. Yeah, so hello everyone. Uh, I am uh, Aniket Pokre, author of the paper Reconstruct, Rasterize, and Backdrop, Dense Shape and Pose Estimation from a Single Image, along with uh, Aditya Agarwal, Krishna Murthy, uh, under, the under the guidance of Professor Madhav Krishna from International Institute of Information and Technology, Hyderabad. We propose, to, we propose a method of obtaining dense object shape along with the six DF poses from a single monocular image. So uh, what we are aiming to do, uh, our task is given an input image, we estimate a dense shape of the object and its 6DOS pose. Uh, this would be very much essential for an object-based SLAM. Uh, that is, if we wish to do SLAM or ego motion estimation using objects, we would want to know their 6DOS poses uh, with respect to cameras. So how do we generate 3D meshes? There have been many recent methods which estimate dense shape from images uh, in the form of meshes like occupancy networks, 
uh, 3D voxels like 3D R2, N2, uh, and point clouds like the point set generation network. As will be explained in the later sections, we will be using occupancy networks for generating meshes for our pipeline. Each method has its upsides and downsides, but generally speaking, voxels need a large memory footprint. Point clouds uh, methods don't really have the connectivity in the structure as compared to a mesh and require further post-processing steps to generate surfaces. Meshes, on the other hand, tend to give good quality surfaces, which tends to be useful in further image rendering applications. So for our case, we used occupancy networks to generate 3D meshes. Uh, we further render the mesh onto the images and then use them for uh, our post estimation. So what is the task of six degree of freedom pose estimation? It is the estimation of the rigid body transformation, that is rotation and translation of an object in a known coordinate frame. There have been several methods catering to the above task. Uh, I would like to mention a few examples like key point based methods in which the key points are detected in monocular images using deep learning and models like wireframe models are fit using PNP techniques. Six pack tra tracks a set of geometrically consistent set of key points on objects in RGBD videos uh, in which it finds the relative post changes of the object over time, which enables to give a six POF pose. Dense fusion uses an architecture that processes color and depth information differently uh, and then fuses both of them using a dense pixel-wise fusion network. In post CNN, an end-to-end 6TOF pose estimation network has been trained uh, with an additional post refinement step. The 3D reconstruction methods that we have gone through cannot be straight away used for downstream robotics tasks uh, since they need to be in the camera frame. That is, we need to know the scale and pose of the mesh uh, with respect to the camera. So this 3D reconstruction methods from monocular images uh, reconstruct objects in canonical frame and has no notion of pose. Hence, to be usable, we need to couple 3D reconstruction with 6 TOF pose estimation so that we get the 3D reconstruction in, in, in the camera frame. So in this case, what can be used? We use the idea of differentiable rasterization. So what is differentiable rasterization? Uh, when we project an object onto an image, we project the vertices of the mesh onto the screen coordinate system, and then we generate the image through grid sampling. The latter process is called rasterization, which is not differentiable. There are a few, there are quite a few methods which deal with uh, differentiable rasterization. First is a uh, neural render, neural 3D mesh renderer, uh, which proposes an approximate gradient for rasterization, which can help to pass gradients through the process of rasterization and enables further optimization tasks. Soft rasterizer views rendering as a soft rendering process in which all the mesh triangles uh, have a probabilistic contribution to each rendered pixel. The interpolation-based differentiable uh, ras renderer views foreground rasterization as a weighted interpolation of local attributes and background rasterization as distance-based aggregation of global face information. But for our purpose, we use the neural mesh renderer by Kato et al. So this is our complete pipeline. Uh, given an input image, we pass the image through the 3D reconstruction network, which gives a mesh of the object. In order to get the scale of the object, we assume the camera height is known. We do this by projecting the mesh onto the image and iteratively solving for the scale of the mesh by comparing the bounding box of the projected mesh and the reference mesh. We also pass the image through a post regressor network for which we use render for CNN which gives us an estimate of the viewpoint of the object. We get an estimate of the translation of the object by using the given camera height. We take the pose from the pose regressor and uh, use it as an initialization for the neural mesh renderer to optimize for the six DOF poses. So here we show some of the qualitative results of our method. 
we take the output post of the post regressor and reproject the mesh onto the image, which is used as an initialization for the neural renderer. As can be seen, the neural renderer then optimizes for the fixed DOF post by comparing the reference and the reprojected images using simply the pixel-wise intensity difference as loss and gives an accurate output. So we also showcase our method for an object-centric ego motion estimation uh, on a synthetic data set. And we can see that our method gives better results as compared to OpsLamp. In this data set, we generate the trajectory using only a single chair. Note that we have used only the chair and no other feature to generate the poses. We open the camera to object poses and then convert them to a camera, camera trajectory. In this case, we have used multiple chairs to generate the trajectory. Uh, and here also it outperforms OpsLAM. We see that OpsLAM doesn't perform as well since the environment is quite textureless. Uh, in our case, the objects are used as features and we estimate the camera track using only the object. Uh, so uh, our method can be used to aid SLAM and improve uh, SLAM or odometry results. So to summarize, uh, we propose to generate the six TOF poses from a monocular image. That is, we construct a dense mesh from a dense mesh reconstruction from a single image and then estimate the pose of the object in camera frame. We also demonstrate results on a monocular object centric ego motion estimation setup using only 3D objects as features. Future works can focus on ob obtaining object reconstructions on images with background. Uh, we can also replace the iterative optimization with an end-to-end -end neural network. So thank you. That was, thank you for the addition. Okay, thank you, and I need it. Okay. Um, okay, um, we have a couple of questions. And um, the first question would be, um, so here you use one image as the input and you can get the 3D reconstruction and as well as the camera pose. And uh, I would assume for those images, you already get the silhouettes and the, which means the background and foreground. And in real, in, in real applications, and uh, in this case, in, in real applications, um, you need to do the segmentation. And uh, have you ever come out, out with any solution if your segmentation is not perfect for silhouettes? Or you, you have tested on real images? Uh, we have try, tried to test on real images. Like we uh, used Detectron 2 from Facebook to mm -hmm. give us a segmentation mask. And then uh, we tried to train the occupancy network in order to get the uh, occupancy network meshes. But we used, after, the, after training, we got occupancy network meshes given the segmentation mask. But then in order for the neural renderer, we take the silhouette loss and we backpropagate that loss. So in that case, the uh, segmentation that we got from Detectron was not good enough to give a good pose. So that is the problem that we were encountering. We did try it for real works, but uh, it wasn't working as well as we expected. Okay, 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 got you, okay. Um, and another question is, um, when you try to do the reconstruction and then um, uh, in your last several slides, actually show you show the trajectory around the object. Um, do you have the mapping result for that for that one? You show the trajectory around a virtual object, but uh, but do you have the, the 3D reconstruction for that virtual object? Uh, I do have the uh, 3D reconstruction, mm -hmm. uh, and it is it's a it is a good reconstruction. So the trajectory, uh, the the more accurate the 3D reconstruction, the more accurate the trajectory is. So, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, is there any other question? Um, I don't have any other question right now from my side. Okay. So so okay. Thank you, Ankinit, and uh, special th special thank you to you because right now the timing in, in India is um, somehow very early, right? What is time in India right now? Uh, actually, I'm in Tokyo now, so it's six thirty a.m. Oh, okay, okay, <laughs> 6.30, okay, okay, it's still pretty early, <laughs> yeah, anyway, okay. 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Anikit. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, let's come to the last uh, contributed paper talk. Is from Felix Ott. Is Felix Ott here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, can you hear me? okay, we can hear you. So we are a little bit ahead of time, but please feel free to go ahead. And uh, and you could have actually a little bit longer time than for, for presentation and the Q&A. Can you see my screen? Um, not yet. Yeah, right now it works. OK, perfect. So thank you all for participating and your interest in my presentation. My name is Felix Ott from Fraunhofer IAS in Nuremberg, Germany, and I'm going to present Viper, Visual Odometry Aided Post Regression for Six Degree of Freedom Camera Localization, which is based on a PostNet like architecture for absolute post regression and a Visual Odometry Aided Relative Post Regression based on optical flow, and which fuses these two modules based on LSTMs. Motivating for our paper, we want to localize autonomous robots and objects in large scale indoor industrial environments, for example, warehouses with high, high level racks. Uh, as shown in the tests and application center at the Fraunhofer IAS in the figures below. As such warehouse environments typically include a costly infrastructure with radio leader or radar bus based systems, we wanted to use a single inexpensive monocular camera for inside out self localization. As visual odometry accumulates a positional drift in long-term navigation tasks, we use convolutional neural networks as it showed to improve um, visual odometry in various aspects. We wanted to use uh, to stabilize the long-term drift and reduce the short-term error of post prediction by introducing optical flow for relative post prediction into the absolute post prediction module. For evaluation, we analyzed environmental influences such as large and small scale areas ambiguous and volatile elements, but also separated echo from feature motion, um, for which the test and application center at the front of IAS perfectly allows to create a data set that covers all these aspects. SLAM-driven 3D point registration methods enable a precise self-localization even in unknown environments. SIFT-like point-based features for the localization from landmarks require efficient retrieval methods, use VLED encodings such as Dense VLED, use anchor points such as AnchorNet in the figure right, or use RANSEC based optimization such as Active Search by Settler. Visual Dometry has made remarkable progress over the last decade, but it still suffers greatly from scaling errors of real and estimated maps. Visual Dometry primarily addresses the problem of separating ego from feature motion, and but it suffers from area constraints, poorly textured environments, scale drift, and also from an, the lack of an initial position. Hence, we wanted to use a PostNet-like architecture for, up, for absolute post regression module that are more robust, less compute intensive, and can be trained in advance on application data. Related work for absolute post regression is, for example, ReloGNet, KMNet, and NNet. Um, these methods um, learn metrics continuously from global image features or user database, as seen in the figures right. The key idea of PostNet and its variants is BranchNet and Hourglass um, uses convolutional neural networks for camera relocalization. Um, they seem to be um, partially insensitive to light changes, occlusions, and motion blur. PostNet 2 learns the loss and architecture parameters of the network. PostNet plus LSTM, DPO, contextual net, and Whitlock um, exploit the time context that is inherently given by consecutive images. The key idea is to identify temporal connections in between the feature vectors with LSTM units. Um, related work for hybrid methods are, for example, VLOG net, TGR nets, and MapNet. Um, that use the absolute post regression techniques and combine it with visual, visual odometry, for example. Um, the 
related work for optical flow based visual odometry was very rare. To the best of our knowledge, there exists only flow odometry and LSVO. Um, to address robot self localization in industrial intro environments that was not covered from these methods before, we introduced visual odometry by optical flow into our absolute pulse regression technique. Here, a post net like variant. That's why we introduced three different modules for absolute pulse regression. Um, furthermore, we can easily replace this each module with a different technique. Um, the whole pipeline we call Viper visual odometry aided pulse regression. So we have a absolute pulse regression module, a convolutional encoder, a relative pulse regression module um, that's based on optical flow and LSTMs. Um, and we um, put the absolute and relative pulses into the fusion module we call pulse estimation, PE, that regresses the absolute pulse. And our goal was to optimize the absolute pose from the PE network to the absolute pose of the APR network. In the following, I go more into detail of these three modules. The input of the APR network um, was three input images. Um, as data pre-processing step, we sender crop the images to size 224 times 224 and subtracted the mean of all images. As we have three input images, the model is time distributed and we use the convolutional encoder GoogleNet. Similar to PostNet, we replace the softmax layer um, with a regression head um, with two fully connected layers. We regress the absolute post P in Euclidean space and the absolute orientation Q as quaternions by minimizing the loss function given below. We set alpha one to one and we search for the op optical optimal hyperparameter beta one. And the input to the relative post regression network RPR are now four input images as we have to calculate the optical flow between each um, consecutive image pair. We use FlowNet2 as we, as FlowNet2 has, the, has a very high um, frame rate of 120 Hertz and it showed to have a very high accuracy. We put the optical flow into the recurrent unit. Um, we use here three stacked LSTM layers. The regression head is again similar to the APR network, just that we regress the relative pose, so the displacement and the rotation of the camera. So the loss function is again similar, similar that just that the poses are relative. And we first have to transform the ground truth absolute poses, so the global coordinate systems to the relative poses cameras. So we have the absolute positions and orientations of the APR network and the relative poses, so the displacements and rotations of the, AP, of the RPR network. We concatenate these features and have a input size of three times 14 to the PE network. Um, we put this tensor into the recurrent unit that consists here of two stacked LSTM layers. The regression head is exactly the same as the regression head of the APR network, just that we use different um, hyperparameters for the loss function. We again set alpha three to one and search for the optimal hyperparameter beta three. And we get the complete pipeline Viper. So again, we have data Preprocessing with center cropping and mean subtraction. And we compute the optical flow with FlowNet2, and we have the two modules APR and RPR. The absolute and relative poses is the input to the PE network. And for evaluation, we compare the absolute poses of the PE network with the absolute poses of the APR network and report the improvement. Um, for evaluation, we need a suitable data set. There exists currently many different data sets, but for our industry scenario, they weren't really suitable. Um, so we decided to use one, the Microsoft Seven Scenes data set as it was the most used data set. As heard in the previous um, presentations, the Seven Scenes data set was recorded in indoor office scenes, several thousand 
uh, several 10,000 images and the spatial extent is very small, so we are below four meters. Current methods achieve good results on datasets for autonomous driving, for example, on the Kitty dataset or on the Microsoft 7 Scenes dataset. Here, VLOG.NET achieves the highest accuracy. These methods are optimized on such datasets and do not cover our aspects of robot self-localization. Hence, we require a novel dataset that addresses large-scale indoor industrial environment. And for that, the link test and application center at the front of IIS in Nuremberg is perfect because it models indoor industrial environments with three high-level warehouse racks. The link center includes ambiguous and untextual elements, and we can model small and large-scale areas in the link hole. For data recording, we use the 3D positioning system that can drive through the complete link hall and automatically records ground truth labels with submillimeter accuracy. So we have a higher accuracy of labels than, for example, the Microsoft 17 data set. The positioning system can drive through the link hall with up to 0.3 meter per second. And we place the cameras at the bottom of the positioning system. And then we record the industry data set that consists of three different scenarios. Scenario number one um, consists of several hundred thousand of training and test images. Example images you can see in the top right at one time step from eight cameras that were placed at, on the bottom of the positioning system. Um, in the two figures left, you can see the trajectories of the training images that were recorded in a horizontal and vertical manner. Um, and the eight testing data sets are perfect to evaluate for different aspects. For example, the cross data set um, has a large scale area in the middle of the link hole and a small scale area in, the, in between the warehouse racks. Um, these areas also cover the small and large scale data sets, but here are also um, the ambiguous elements included that were represented by the big black walls here in the figure, you, you can see this. The volatility data set cons, um, contains elements that were not included in the training data set. So we can test here for volatile elements. Um, scenario number two was recorded also on the positioning system, but with three wide angle cameras. Um, it consists of more velocities and different variations than scenario number one. And the size of the area is also smaller. The challenge here for, for example, visual odometry is that the movement direction of the testing data set was different than the movement direction of the training data set. And to have a more um, movement like um, scenario that simulates a autonomous robot. We recorded scenario number three, also with wide angle cameras on a forklift truck. Um, the forklift truck um, simulated putting in or removing elements from the warehouse racks. Um, the camera movements are now at a varying fast and dynamic speeds. And so scenario number three is the most challenging data set of the industry data set. Um, we train now the APR model and the RPR model and the post estimator. And we present here the results of the APR only network, the APR plus LSTM network and Viper. And we present the results for the Microsoft 7 scenes data set and for all, for all scenarios of our novel industry data set. Um, and we show the positional improvement of Viper against APR. Um, all results are in meters for position and in degrees for orientation as median errors. Um, we go more into detail of the mostly significant results. For the Microsoft 7 scenes dataset, we, um, Viper improves only from 0.33 to 0.32 meters. Um, that's averaged over all scenes. Um, as this dataset contains much motion blur, and the relative um, position between consecutive image pairs was very small. 
So the relative, so the RPR module has only a small impact to Viper. So the position improvement is only about 3%. The average for scenario number one um, is for APR only um, 2.82 meters and for Viper 2.53 meters. So we improve about 12.3% in, in average. Um, for example, the cross data set improves from 0.61 meters to 0.46 meters. And here, as I said, is the large scale area in the middle of the link hole and the um, small scale area in between the warehouse racks. Um, also, the large scale and the small scale area covers these areas. Um, you can also see here the improvement about 10.7% and 40.4% in position, but the improvement is um, smaller than the cross data set because here the ambiguous elements were included. Um, for, the, for these positions, um, the error increased. So from these data sets, we can say that Viper is more robust against um, differently scaled areas. Um, for the volatility data set, Viper improves from 2.1 to 1.96 meters. Um, that's an improvement of about 6.4%. Um, the improvement is only 6% as in this data set, volatile elements were included that were not included in the training data set. But RPR has a positive impact rate it is small. Um, you can also see that the or orientation error increases here as also the APR network is not robust against these volatile elements. So the orientation error increases here. For scenario number two, um, Viper improves from 0 0.2 meters to 0 0.2 meters. Uh, sorry, from 0 0.27 to 0 0.2 meters. Um, that's an improvement about 30% in position, but the orientation error decreases. That's because, um, as I said, here in the test data set, relative movements were included that were not included in the training set. So RPR cannot fully generalize to new movement directions and hence the orientation error decreases. For scenario number three, um, that was the most challenging data set, um, the um, varying and high dynamic ego motions were included. But Viper improves from 0 0.32 to 0 0.27 meters. And the orientation error is unchanged. into detail of the RPR network. Um, for example, for scenario number three, um, we get an average error in median for X direction in about 2.5 centimeters and in Y direction of 4.1 centimeters. Um, that's pretty good, but um, RPR is unrobust in cases where optical flow is computed by Flowner 2 wrongly. That happens, for example, if the camera is very close to the warehouse rack and the movement direction was not clear. Um, if I compare APR and Viper, um, I can summarize for scenario number one that Viper is through RPR more robust in small and large scale areas. If I get, compare the trajectories from scenario number two here in the left image, we can say that um, Viper compensates the long-term drift and smooths the short-term errors. For scenario number three, that were um, where fast and large scale and high dynamic echo motion was included. Um, also Viper smooths the trajectory and reduces the short-term errors. Um, sorry, and in conclusion, we introduced a novel data set um, that was not covered by different methods before. Um, we, and we tuned our method on this data set to address challenges of large scale indoor industrial environments. We increased the, increased, increased the accuracy by introducing optical flow for relative post regression and we addressed different aspects. 
And in future work, we want to evaluate different available methods on the industry data set and show or show the applicability of self-localization of robots in industrial environments. And if you have now any questions, I would be happy. Okay, thank you, Felix. Um, uh, we have a couple of questions. And um, first, um, for your own data set, how do you get the ground truth? Um, in the link hall, there are 10 um, Nikon IGBS um, systems included. You can see this here, that's very small, and it delivers a accuracy below one millimeter. Okay. So, so we can cover here the whole link hall. Okay, okay. So those, those, okay, those markers are wrong. I can see the markers are wrong. It seems very small though. Okay. And uh, when you do that, when you do the localization, um, does those markers do in the, uh, do those markers in the images? When you do the real testing? Sorry, which markers? So, so for, for those, I can see them. So I can see those markers on the, around the, around the scene. Seems like, is it some some markers there? Um, the QR code note that is oh, not used, okay. that, that was for okay. a different project. Yes. Okay. For those, you get ground truth from those, and but when you do the testing, are they are those kind of QR codes still in the testing images? Um, we record uh, ground truth labels for training and testing data set, but they are not used for testing, only for training, and we use the ground truth labels for testing. Okay. Because, yeah. Okay, and uh, another question is, um, when you show the APR and the RPR, and uh, it seems like they are in parallel, and uh, finally goes to the P, uh, the final loss. What is I, I forgot the name of the of the final loss. P. P yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, when you do the when you do the testing, when you in your last couple of experiments, and uh, you show just uh, using APR and the final VIP, VIPR and the, what is the imp improvement. And uh, later you show the RPR and the, and the final experiment. And have you seen um, somehow when you do the testing, you, um, you are use the network trained on the complete network and to finally get the, ca the, the camera pose. Or you just uh, remove one APR or, P or RPR and the train on a separate branch. And the, which, which way did you, did you do for, for that testing? So we trained each module separately. We first trained APR and RPR, and we also tested it separately. And okay. then for training the PE network, we predicted the lab, um, we predicted the process with APR and RPR that was the input to PE and trained it with that. And testing of the PE network is the same. So we use predict the poses with APR and RPR and test the PE network. Okay, okay. Um, so for the, you show the position and then you show the, uh, the, the rotation and the, do you have some conclusion whether it's uh, it, the, your current reality, you, you in, um, added the reality pose regression and uh, the reality post regression improves position more or rotation more in accuracy. Sorry, I think I did you answer. Uh, so, so you should, um, after you're adding in, in VIPP compared with post night, and uh, here you increase the position and the rotation accuracy, and which aspect in position and the rotation, which aspect is improving more? from the reality of post regression that. So we um, increased the accuracy of APR more, um, but that also um, depends on the movement patterns and the ambiguous elements, for example. So how exact APR and RPR um, is. And on the accuracy of the single networks um, depends also the improvement of the PE network. So we can really make a general um, statement about how position and orientation exactly improves with PE, um, because it also depends on the scene and on the 
um, movement pattern. Okay, and uh, do you have the speed about you, your localization? Yes, so um, APR is the Google net that I think is below 21 million parameters. And for comparison, RPR has about 200,000 parameters for training and PE below or approximately 100,000. So the RPR and PE network are very high to predict and to estimate a pose. So it, the, um, the speed is just a bit slower than the APR network. Okay, I can see you are using all optical flow in the in the RPR and optical flow. Um, so I, it depends on what kind of optical flow neural network you are using. You are using neural network on or, or traditional optical flow here. Yes, we use FlowNet two to predict the optical flow, okay. and that we use for the RPR network. Okay, and on the on the uh, FlowNet, I remember that is pretty large, and uh, and uh, here I can I can imagine, and the network we would by adding the relative, uh, by adding RPR would also increase the size of your neural network significantly. Is it true? Um, yes, um, but FlowNet two was when we developed Viper and the um, fastest network for optical flow, I think 120 Hertz. Mm -hmm. And so the impact of predicting the optical flow was um, not high. Okay, okay. Okay, but I, I can imagine you can optical flow, you are just using using their existing network here, but you can replace it with any other things that could still work for your RPR. I can, yes, we can, I, yeah. we can replace flow and two, and we can also replace RPR. Um, so I think we could also replace it with flowdometry that directly predicts with flow net the relative position. Mm -hmm. That could also be an uh, option but we did it that way to better evaluate it for every detail. Okay, okay, great. Um, so is there any other, other question from the audience? Okay, um, if no, um, let's send to Felix again. Thank you very much, Felix. And uh, I can imagine, yeah, I can imagine it's, our, it's also very late in, in Europe. It's 12 o'clock, right? Yes, almost 24 okay. p.m. Okay. So uh, this is our, our last uh, contributed paper talk. Uh, we will um, probably will take, is there any other question from the audience for any of those paper? Um, the first paper is already also not here, right? Okay, so we can have uh, about 15 minutes um, coffee break and we will come back uh, at 6, 6.10, and uh, we will follow up with uh, Dr. Shi Chao Yang's talk yeah, yeah. and uh, Christian Grauman's talk, and uh, later is Shu Xie Quan's talk, and uh, finally that is Pierre uh, Mullen's talk, and we will follow up with another four ex uh, exciting uh, keynote speakers. Okay. Okay, we will have a 10 minutes break, 10 to 15 minutes break. Mm-hmm.